part of this morning's epistle. Therefore, if food is cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Thursday of this week was not only an opportunity to celebrate Robert Burns, but also the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. Maybe these two great writers and observers of the human condition don't often get mentioned in the same sentence, and then, mostly, alas, only to draw deep contrast between them. Burns, the free spirit, life-affirming, the apostle of a broad and warm humanity, Paul, the stern, restrictive preacher of a God of rigorous justice and judgment, nursing his wrath to keep it warm. Let's see if we can unpick that crude stereotype a little by looking at this morning's epistle. 1 Corinthians 8, probably not your favorite or best known passage of Paul, but nevertheless, with one very specific, basically, it deals, should members of the church in Corinth accept an invitation to dinner in a temple? Not, not exactly a contemporary theme. The problem was, however, that meat served in the temple would have been sacrificed to idols. So, temples being open to view by bypassers, some members of the church will have been seen by other members eating food offered to idols, to spirits. And this had proved to be very disturbing to them. It probably also underlined social divisions in the congregation between those who mixed in the sort of circles in Corinth who could afford to dine and invite people to the temple and poorer members, many of them migrants, resident aliens, who would associate the meeting, eating meat more with popular religious festivals when meat offered to the gods and goddesses was shared more widely. For the latter, spirit worship would still be a vivid memory from their past. And they were clearly very disturbed by the kind of mixed messages they seemed to be getting from the better off Christians in the congregation, possibly the more influential ones. Here Paul is forced to deal with the realities of the emergence of a new monotheistic religion in a context dominated by animistic beliefs in spirits and gods and goddesses. We've seen from the gospel too, how that was the context in which Jesus was operating. The first thing he does, exorcise somebody. How does Paul deal with this situation? He first sets out a confident monotheistic belief. We know that no idol in the world really exists and that there's no God but one. That for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. But in the middle of that, he actually also interjects, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and lords. Very odd. As if both acknowledging the deep-seated anxieties of pagan converts, and at the same time trying to subsume them within a stronger monotheistic framework. And the question is, what practical consequences does he draw from this? How, how does he attempt to resolve this dispute? Different. Earlier, Paul had addressed the Thessalonians as those who had turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. I might think then that he would have endorsed those who deny the reality of such spirits. 
and had no scruples about eating meat in temples. But instead, he's thinking about the other side. And he appeals to these people with knowledge to think about the consequence of their actions for the weaker other members of the congregation whose faith could be seriously undermined by their carefree attitudes towards meat sacrificed to idols. Paul's not here asserting and driving through some great spiritual insight. What's more important, asserting spiritual, the superior theological knowledge we have or not undermining the nascent faith of those who've just entered the church from an animistic pagan background. And Paul is clear about that. If food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. His verdict is pastoral and pragmatic. However correct your beliefs about the non-existence or powerlessness of spirits, if the way you behave is causing others to falter in their faith, then stop it. It's a fascinating discussion. And one learns much about Paul's personality and theology by watching how he picks his way through the minefields of the conflicting beliefs that still trouble the church today in many parts of the world. Paul, as it were, faces two ways. He has a profound vision of God's power and grace. God, the source of all reality, has revealed God's self to us through his Son, through Jesus, the source, as he will write later in his second epistle, the source of all consolation and renewal, new life. And yet Paul also allows that there are more things in the world than such an account might suggest. And that there are, as he says to the Galatians, dark forces of evil, he speaks about this evil world from which Christ has rescued us. And it seems to me that Paul is willing to live with the kinds of ambiguity that this combination of claims brings with it. But faced with difficult decisions, what will ultimately count is the sense of God's compassion and love, his care for the weak and the vulnerable. And you can hear echoes, really, in that, I think, in that um, ruling. You know, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. And if you can't hear echoes there of the, of the lost sheep, I think you can. He is not, that is to say, giving us, Paul is not, giving us a rounded systematic account of what God, the world, and humanity is like. He is doing the creative hard work of thinking through the implications of the new light that has burst on him. Its implications for his understanding of life and death, light and darkness, <coughs> sin and grace, of God's overflowing, superabundant love. And his views gain definition as he engages with issues as they come up, like who you should be going out to dinner with and where. This is the sort of on the hoof theologian that Paul is. There's no denying the depths of his convictions, his conviction of his call, of the vision that he received of Christ as the source of overflowing new life, of consolation and love, of liberation. But there is also a provisionality about the way he expresses himself. 
And it's interesting, if you have a look at this afterwards, you know, at the beginning, the first paragraph, he, he talks about different kinds of knowledge. All of us possess knowledge, he says. But knowledge of itself is not necessarily good. Knowledge puffs us up, can make us proud and complacent. What we need is love which builds us up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. That's slightly an unexpected end to that sentence. You might have thought he would have said, you know, anyone who loves God People who have knowledge, they don't know anything. But somebody who loves God, they really know God. He doesn't say that. He says, anyone who loves God is known by God. To say that anyone who loves God really knows God might suggest, heaven forbid, that the person who loves God knows all the answers. That would be terrible. It's not like that at all. Those who love God open themselves up to God, to experiencing God's love, to being known by God's self. That's the beginning of a never-ending quest. Paul is not simply dishing out the truth as he's received it, as some might like to read him. He like all believers, is discovering what it is to be loved by the God of the Jesus in whose wide and loving created spirit he now lives. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.